get our YouVersion outline out and turn to Mark chapter 5. We're going to look at another one of the Beatitudes today. And I've been having a great time with this sermon series titled Upside Down, looking at each of the Beatitudes. Some people sometimes wonder, <clears throat> why are the Beatitudes written differently in the text of my Bible? And I had someone actually ask me this question this week. So you're reading through the book of Matthew, and most of the text is in paragraph format. But then you get to the Beatitudes, and you think to yourself, why are they indented like that? Why, are they have those, why does it have those funny indentations? Well, here's why. Go back to Psalms or go back to Proverbs, and you'll see that poetry in the Bible is written slightly differently because there are stanzas and there are like verses of poetry. And so the Beatitudes are given to us by Matthew in the Gospel of Matthew in a poetic format. And so sometimes in poetry, you'll have like two lines that go together. It's like line A, line B. And then the next verse is line A, line B. And then the next verse is line A, line B. It's because it's given to you in poetic format. That's why it's easy for us to memorize the Beatitudes. There's like part A of the Beatitude and then part B of the Beatitude. And it's given to us specifically in poetic format so that we would remember it. So Jesus is preaching orally to these people on this mountaintop. He wants them to remember it. This is something that he repeats over and over. In Luke chapter 6, Jesus preaches the Sermon on the Plain, and he gives us some of the Beatitudes, but not all of them. And so we see that Jesus repeats this message over and over many different places. And so to help people remember the message, he makes it somewhat poetic. There's like point A, point B, and then there's the next one, A, B, and then the next one, A, B. It's poetry. Is everybody with me today? And so I challenge you, memorize the Beatitudes. I memorized the Beatitudes when I was a junior in high school. And I encourage you to memorize the Beatitudes as well. It's somewhat easy to do because of the format. Because of that format, each message that I've shared with you in the series Upside Down basically has two parts, part A and part B. Part A is the kingdom principle or the attitude that we ought to have, the activity that we ought to be engaged in. And then part B is the second part of the Beatitude, which is the kingdom promise. And so let's read Matthew chapter 5, verse 9 together, and you'll see the first half is a kingdom principle, and the second half is the kingdom promise. Let's read it together. We're going to put it on a slide for you so you can read along. We're going to read it out loud three times. Here we go. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they will be called children of God. This time, you can read along with me because we got upside down off and we'll put the scripture on the screen. Here we go. Read it with me. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they will be called children of God. Let's read it one more time. I want you to get it into your head. I want you to get it into your heart. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they will be called children of God. In the days of the Old West, the Colt Arms Company developed in 1873... A, 44, a 45 caliber revolver, it was a single action revolver called the Colt 45. It was produced from the 1870s all the way up to the early 1940s. Then they stopped making it for a brief period of time. It was so popular, they began making it again in the 1950s. And for about another 20 years, there was like a second edition of Colt 45s that were on the market. It's a six-shooter revolver. If you've ever watched a cowboy movie, you've seen a Colt 45. Anybody seen a Colt 45 on a cowboy movie? If you ever see a general in World War II or World War I uh, sporting a revolver with pearl-handled uh, pearl grips, uh, that's probably a Colt 45. It was it became the standard issue for the United States Army shortly after its introduction in 1873. It became a standard law enforcement weapon. Police officers and sheriffs all over the country carried a Colt 45. Um, then outlaws and cowboys started carrying Colt 45s. How many, how many of you can fall asleep watching a cowboy movie? Anybody with me today? I can fall asleep on a good old cowboy movie. And, and over and over and over again, you'll see some guy quick draw... That's it with his Colt 45, and that's the gun that they said uh, all the cowboys carried. Well, after a while, the Colt 45, this weapon that brought death so many places, and this weapon that was made for, for stopping people, scaring people, or even killing people, it developed a nickname. Can you guys remember what the nickname was for the Colt 45? Peacemaker. Peacemaker. 
the weapon that the, the law enforcement, the army, the outlaws, and the cowboys carried became known as the peacemaker. You know, sometimes we superimpose an idea of, of peace being accomplished by violent means. We think that if we've got a bigger weapon, that we can gain peace. We'll have peace, and we'll have it our way, because I carry a bigger stick. That's the way Americans think, isn't it? And it's that kind of thinking that ultimately got us into the Cold War. How many of you are old enough to remember the Cold War? Some of you are old enough to remember the Cold War and maybe some of the drills that you had in your public school where you would get under the desk or you'd have to go into the bomb shelter to prepare students for a possible nuclear attack because we had made enough nuclear weapons to destroy the whole world, not just win a war. And we thought, the more weapons we have, the more likely we will have peace. It's kind of confusing, isn't it? And we will sometimes superimpose an idea of making peace that really doesn't bring peace. Jesus said, blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall be called sons of God. When we hear about peace today, sometimes we think about international affairs. We think about peace between nations. We think about a lack of war. I have a friend who is in the Air Force, and he just said last week in a conversation we were having, I'm so grateful that we're in a time of peace. It makes my job a whole lot easier. And right now, it feels like we're in a time of peace where there's not war. But can I tell you something? Though there's not war... Though the United States of America may not have declared war against anybody right now, we may not be engaging in a war right now, there are people all around in a time of peace that have no peace. In a time of peace, people can have no peace. But Jesus said that we can be peacemakers in turbulent times. Jesus said that we can be peacemakers in our world. And some of you are saying, well, I can't be a peacemaker. I'm not an ambassador I don't have a position, I don't have a title, I don't have a letter from the governor or the president or from law enforcement or a judge or the courthouse. I don't have any authority to make peace. But Jesus said that you and I can be peacemakers. And you don't have to have that kind of title and you don't have to have that kind of position and you don't have to have that kind of authority given to you to be a peacemaker in your world. Is everybody with me today? We have an opportunity to be peacemakers in our world today. Peace is a whole lot more than an absence of war. Peace, as we're going to find out, has to do with peace with God, peace with ourselves, and peace with others. Now, to look at this beatitude like we have the others before it, we're going to look at the kingdom principle first, and then we'll look at the kingdom promise. Let's look at the kingdom principle, blessed are the peacemakers. Blessed are the peacemakers. I love uh, one Bible commentator. He said the best way to translate blessed is to say, oh, the bliss, oh, the bliss of peacemakers. Oh, the joy of peacemakers. It's not just a blessing to be a peacemaker, like you're so blessed. It's not just a sign that you bought at Hobby Lobby, although I like Hobby Lobby. I spent an hour or so on Hobby Lobby yesterday, and it's on my mind. It's not just about having a sign that's got blessed and cursed. Blessed is is this state of exuberant outburst of joy. Oh, the bliss. Oh, the joy. Oh, the excitement of a peacemaker. And what is peace? In this passage, there are a bunch of people listening to Jesus preach, and most of them are Jewish people. They're all from Galilee. They're gathered around Jesus on this hilltop, probably a grassy hilltop. They've all sat down to listen to him speak. And most of them being Jewish have an idea of what peace is. They have a concept of peace. Jewish people in those days would greet one another with a common greeting, shalom, which is the word peace. So when you would go to shake hands with somebody or greet them in the marketplace or meet them along the road, you would touch hands and say shalom. Shalom. It was an offering of peace 
to that person. This word shalom was so important in the Hebrew culture. So when Jesus said, blessed are the peacemakers, most of the Jewish people that are listening to Jesus, the Jewish theologian and Jewish son of God, they get an idea of what peace is in the Jewish mindset. And it is this word shalom. The word peace is still used in the regular greeting in the Middle East today. When Arabic people greet one another, they greet one another with the word peace, salam, which is very similar to the Hebrew word shalom. And it's the same concept. So what does shalom mean? In Judges chapter 6, verse 4, Gideon, the farmer turned warrior, builds an altar to the Lord to give thanks to God. And he builds an altar and he called the altar, the Lord is peace. It's in that passage of scripture that we receive the redemptive name of God, Jehovah Shalom. It's that word peace. It's such an important word. Not only is it the word that they greet one another with, but it's one of the words that describes the nature and the person of God. It's one of his redemptive names, shalom. So what is this shalom kind of peace? Well, number one, shalom is inner peace. So when I greet someone and I say shalom, I'm saying I want you to have inner peace. I want you to be okay on the inside. I want you to be at peace on the inside. It's inner peace. Number two, it's personal welfare. I want you to be doing well. I want things to be going right for you. You have enough clothing, you have enough food, you have a job, things are going well in your family. It's just personal welfare. I want you to do well. I want you to to be above average and be satisfied with where you are in life. Number three, it's physical soundness. Shalom. means I hope you're healthy. When you sneeze and there's a German person nearby, they'll say, Gesundheit, which is good health. And so shalom carried with it this greeting that says, I want you to have inner peace, I want you to be doing well, and I want you to have good health in your body. That's part of peace in shalom. And then the last part of peace in the word shalom is success. And there are some places in the Old Testament where the word shalom is actually translated success. I I want you to have success in your venture. In some of the Old Testament historical books, the word shalom is translated as success or successful. And so this word shalom is loaded with a bunch of meaning. Is everybody with me today? And when Jesus said, blessed are the peacemakers, many of the people listening to him immediately thought about the Jewish concept of peace, shalom. But I want you to see the second thing about this word, peacemakers. The Greek word that Matthew uses to write the story in the book of Matthew has some different connotations. The first audience on that mountainside listening to Jesus speak probably thought about peace in Jewish terms because they were Jewish people. They thought shalom. But when Matthew wrote it down, he wrote it in Greek. And the Greek term is used in every New Testament book of the Bible. If there's one word that shows up all over the New Testament, it's this Greek word for peace. It shows up 88 times in the New Testament. Paul opens almost every letter with a prayer or a hope for peace using this Greek term. He says, grace and peace to you from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ, doesn't he? He desires that the church would have grace from God and peace from God. And what does this Hebrew word mean? Where is it used other places? Well, in the other places that we see this word used, we see that it means peace with God. A person can be reconciled to God and have this kind of peace in relationship with God through Jesus Christ. So when Jesus says, blessed are the peacemakers... This particular word, as it's used in other places in the New Testament, means that a peacemaker could be someone who is helping someone else have a peaceful relationship with God. Blessed are the peacemakers. Man, I can't think of a really turbulent situation where I could bring peace. But you know what? I can think of somebody who's away from God, who doesn't have peace with God, and I can help them find peace with God. That's a part of peacemaking. So this word is used over and over in the New Testament to describe peace with God. At one time in our lives, we were enemies of God. We needed to be reconciled to God. 
We needed to have our relationship with him mended and repaired and fixed. And because of what Jesus did on the cross, because of Jesus Christ, we can be reconciled to God and we can have peace with God. So first of all, it's peace with God. Here's the second way that this word is used over and over in the New Testament. It's peace with myself. Peace with myself. At the end of Romans chapter 7, Paul is writing about his condition before he was a Christian. And this is what he says about himself. He says, the things that I did, I did not want to do. And the things that I wanted to do, I could not do. And then he said this like almost terrible thing. He said, O wretched man that I am, who will rescue me from this body of death? That's like severe, isn't it? It's a person who did not have peace with themselves. And all of us battle with temptation. All of us battle with some inner things that are frustrating and difficult. Some things maybe that we don't want to do. Some ways that we don't want to respond. Some things that we don't want to say. Some facial expressions we don't want to make. We wrestle with those things on the inside. But with God's help, we can have inner peace and be victorious in those struggles. Listen to what Paul says next in Romans chapter 8, verse 1. He says, therefore, there is no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus, because the law of the spirit of life has set us free from the law of sin and death. Oh, he, there was a time in his life where he did not have inner peace. What he wanted to do, he could not do. And what he kept doing, he didn't want to do anymore. He struggled, he wrestled. He was burdened with this frustration on the inside, but with the salvation that he received in Jesus and the help of the Holy Spirit, he was transformed to have inner peace. Can I tell you something? We find inner peace in a relationship with Jesus Christ. We find inner peace in a relationship with Jesus Christ. God wants you to have inner peace today. God wants you to have inner peace today. Some of you are looking at me and uh, maybe you're thinking, you have no idea what I'm going through, Pastor. You have no idea why I don't have inner peace today. No, I don't. But I'm telling you, there's a God who loves you and there's a God who knows and there's a God who understands you. And he understands you psychologically. He understands you biologically. He understands you spiritually. And he is a God who can give you inner peace. He's a God who can give you inner peace. That's not my notes, but I felt like the Holy Spirit needed somebody to hear that God has peace for you on the inside. That war that's been going on on the inside, he can bring peace. So this word, this Greek word means peace with God. Other times it's used to talk about peace with myself. And then the last way that this word is used in the New Testament is used to describe peace with other people. Peace with friends. Peace with family members, peace with coworkers, peace with your neighbors, peace with people. We can have peace with God, I can have inner peace, and I can have peace with others. I can have personal welfare, I can have success, and I can have physical soundness. God wants you to have peace. Is everybody with me today? God wants you to have peace today. And he wants to give you peace. Blessed are the peacemakers. Now, here's the next thing I want you to see. We've talked about the word peace, but let's talk about peacemakers. Because Jesus takes the word peace and he mashes it with a word for make or create or develop. And so Jesus says, blessed are the peacemakers. Watch this. Jesus didn't say, blessed are the peace lovers. He said, blessed are the peacemakers. There's a lot of people that want peace, there's a lot of people that might value peace. There's a lot of people that are looking for peace. But the people that are going to be blessed, according to this scripture, are the people that make peace. That's like the person that will work for it. It's the person that will, that will bring it to a situation. It's the person that will introduce it in a time of conflict. It's a person that will change the atmosphere with their attitude and the presence of the Holy Spirit in their life. That's a peacemaker. It's not just a person who wants peace. Everybody wants peace. But Jesus said, blessed are those who make peace. That means we need to be active and there's something for us to do. Is everybody with me today? Yeah. Blessed are the peacemakers. A peacemaker is a leader. A peacemaker is a leader. A peacemaker cares enough about other people, really cares, 
to confront. Some people just like to confront and they're argumentative. That's not always peaceful. Somebody say amen. Some people are just argumentative. But I'm talking about a person that's a peacemaker and they care enough to confront. There's actually an old book written back in the like 80s or 90s called Caring Enough to Confront and it's a pretty interesting read. So a peacemaker is a leader. A peacemaker is a person who cares enough to confront. A peacemaker is a person who breaks down barriers between people. Breaks down barriers. Barriers of hatred. Barriers of dislike. Uh, barriers of wealth and economic station. Well, I can't be friends with them. They are rich and have those kinds of clothes. I can't be friends with them. They don't look like me. It's a person that breaks down racial barriers. That's a peacemaking person. A person that breaks down the barriers that we've created between people. You know, there's this outline at Bible.org, and I've just had to put this in my notes so you know where I got it from, but just in studying and, and getting ready for the message, I came up with this, this, this outline of ways that we can be peacemakers, and it was so good, I was like, you know what? I may have found it on the internet, but I'm actually gonna use it. How many of you are like, man, those pastors, they find our sermon on the internet. That's no way to hear from God. Well, can I just tell you something? Studying and looking up something on the internet, I found this list, and I, I had to change some of the wording just a little bit, but this is so practical, and it's so good. I just got to give it to you today. Listen to this, this list of ways in which we can be a peacemaker. It's like tips for being a peacemaker, and they're really practical. So you guys ready for practical? Yes. Here's some practical ways to be a peacemaker with the Lord. Number one, continually get rid of sin in your own life. You want to be a peacemaker? You got to continually get rid of sin in your own life. It's no wonder that the beatitude before this one is, blessed are the pure in heart, for they'll see God. Being a peacemaker follows the pure in heart beatitude. Let's get rid of sin. Sin always destroys. Sin never brings peace. Amen? Sin always destroys. Sin never brings peace. So get rid of sin in your heart, get rid of sin in your life. You want to be a peacemaker? Then maybe you'll have to get rid of some arrogance and add some humility. You'll have to get rid of some selfishness and gain some selflessness because it's not always about winning the argument. Maybe it's about winning the person. It's about getting rid of some sin in my heart so that I can relate to someone with a pure heart and with clean hands. If I'm going to be a peacemaker... I want to get rid of the sin that's in my life. I want to live a pure and holy life. I want to have pure motives for my peacemaking. Well, I want peace at work, or I'll have to find a new job, or I'll ha I won't get the raise, or I won't have this successful thing happen to me. Can I, can I want peace with God for a higher reason than my own selfish reasons? Absolutely I can, but it may require that I get rid of some sinful motives. And if I've got sin in my life, it can always hinder my ability to make peace with others. So number one, continually get rid of sin in our own lives. Number two, want to be a peacemaker? Be honest with love. The Bible says that we need to speak the truth, but speak the truth in love. Be honest, but be loving about it. Sometimes there are situations that we have to confront if we're going to be peacemakers, but let's confront things in a loving, kind way. I mean, there are ways that you can tell somebody the truth and just crush them. Well, I'm going to win that argument. You ever stay up at night thinking about all the ways that you're going to win an argument? You ever had that? Have you, I, sometimes when I'm mowing the lawn, I'm like talking through my head, like all the ways I'm going to win the argument. Have you ever had those kind of conversations in your head? You come up with all these one-liners and these zingers and things like that. Like, I, I can crush them next time I talk to them. I'm like, that's not speaking the truth in love. So let's be honest but let's be honest with love. Number three, be the initiator. A peacemaker is a leader. So that means be the initiator. Jesus said that sometimes when there's trouble or someone's offended us or someone's been wounded or there's been a problem, we must go to that person. Go to them. Well, it wasn't my fault. Jesus said, go to them. Well, I'm going to wait till they come and ask for forgiveness. And you know what? They need to come groveling. I mean, sometimes we feel that way, don't we? <laughs> but Jesus said, you don't have to wait for them. You can be the initiator. Sometimes that's backfired on me. One time a guy just like totally cut me down, totally made fun of me. 
uh, was real harsh. Man, I was kind of bitter for a couple months. And then at a church service, I felt like the Holy Spirit said, Paul, you got to get rid of that bitterness. And I said, I do need to get rid of that bitterness. So I marched up to the balcony of that church. I walked right up to that man and I said, I just want you to know I forgive you for all, the, all those times you made fun of my clothes. And he's like, who are you? What's your name? What are you even talking about? I was like, well, oh, that didn't work. <laughs> And, and he walked away. I was like, oh, no, man. And I, and I thought, now he thinks I'm a nut because he doesn't even realize how bad he hurt me. And I've been carrying all this wound. And when I go to approach him and, and do something about it, I kind of went with like this arrogant, I'm right, you're wrong attitude. And boy, it just totally backfired. It was a bad deal. But sometimes we've got to be the initiator and be honest with love and be careful as the initiator when we go and approach that problem where there's trouble. Jesus said we should be the initiator, but we've got to initiate right. Is everybody with me today? So in one, continually get rid of sin. Two, be honest with love. Number three, be the initiator. Number four, listen more than you speak. Listen more than you speak. James, the book of wisdom in the New Testament tells us this, be slow to speak, slow to anger. Be slow to speak, slow to anger. Listen, listen. Remember what your mom always told you when you were a kindergartner. Son, young lady, you've got two ears and one mouth. So listen more than you talk. A couple months ago, I was in one of my doctoral classes, and I had a whole lot of input on Monday afternoon. And so I went to my room that night, and I said, you know what, Lord? I talk too much today. I need to learn from my friends. Tomorrow, I won't say anything till 9 a.m., so I went to class, I went to class, and I sat there quietly, and I just, I made all the other students give all the input. I'm like, I've got ideas, I've got thoughts, but I'm just, I told God I was going to be quiet till 9 a.m. At, not, at 8.45, the professor looked across the big table at me, and he goes, Shepherdly, I see it all over your face. What are you thinking? Because <laughs> I had thoughts, you know what I'm saying? But I'm not, not sharing them because I'm trying to teach myself to be slow to speak and not hog all the talking time. And uh, I said, I felt like God told me that I need to be quiet till nine o'clock today and give other people a chance to speak because I talked so much yesterday. And he laughed and he said, okay. Because <laughs> he probably thought I talked too much the day before. We got to learn sometimes to, to listen more than we speak. Sometimes when you're in these situations that kind of are tense or it's difficult, we need to listen to someone completely before we start formulating all of our answers. Listen completely. Sometimes uh, people will come to me and they want to talk about marriage or things like that. And I tell them, hey, here's one of the rules. You got to listen completely. When we're sitting down, uh, my wife and I and, and you as a couple, uh, here are the rules. When this person's speaking, you're not going to interrupt them. And you're going to listen to them completely before you formulate your answer and your response to them. Hear it all before you come up with your response. Listen completely. Let's be slow to speak and slow to anger, let's make sure that we listen more than we speak. Number five, you guys ready for number five? Develop healthy communication skills. Healthy communication skills. Proverbs chapter 15 verse one says this, a, a harsh word stirs up anger, but a gentle answer puts away wrath. That's one of my favorite Proverbs in all of the book of Proverbs. A harsh word stirs up anger, but a gentle answer turns away or puts away wrath. Let's be careful how we respond. Let's be careful how we communicate. Let's be careful what words we use. Let's speak carefully to one another and not be harsh. And so that means I've got to work on healthy communication schools, skills that include my facial expressions, that in, includes the tone of my voice, the, the volume level of my voice. It includes my vocabulary. Be careful about the words that you use. Sometimes when I'm talking with people, I can tell that they're using a word that means something differently to them than it means to me. And so I'll say to someone, okay, so when you use this word, what did that mean? I got to ask you a question because I'm not sure that you mean what I think you mean. Sometimes there are words that have multiple meanings, right? And so I just stop and I'll ask someone, when you use that word, what did you mean by that? And I, I kind of pull that out of someone and it forces me to listen more, right? And understand what they're really saying to me before I 
formulate my response. It's, it's healthy communication skills to understand the words and make sure you use the right word. If you have to think a little bit and, and work a little more slowly, then work a little more slowly. Take your time and communicate clearly and, and engage in healthy communication skills. Listen, you guys know I talk and I'm a vocabulary guy. I'm not good at number games. So like if you wanna play a game where you have to find numbers really fast on like 10 dice or something, you will beat me. But if we're gonna play a word game, I might crush you, because I'm a word guy. <laughs> when, when my son Gabe and I are on the same team and we're playing a word game, we mess people up so bad because he's a word guy and I'm a word guy and we read each other's minds. So like it's, it's like some word game and, you know, uh, like Pictionary. He draws one line on a marker board and I'm like, house of cards. And he's like, yeah, that's right. And he raises the one vertical line and I, it's like, how did that happen? It's like, I don't know. It's just the first thing that came to my mind because of the look on his face and the way he held the pen. We're word people. And so we're good at words. But if you're not good at words, let's say you're more of a number person. You're gifted and you're skilled at that. Listen, you still want to work on your communication skills so that you're a peacemaker. Is everybody with me today? Number six, return good for evil. Sometimes our kind and loving intervention is not received well. But my encouragement to you is keep doing good even if in your attempt to make peace, someone does something evil back to you. Keep doing good to that person. Listen to what the Bible says. Do not grow weary in doing good, for in due season you'll reap a harvest. Do not grow tired. Do not grow weary in doing good. So when you attempt to make peace, you attempt to communicate, you attempt to speak some truth in love, recognize that you might not be received well. Please return evil with more good. Continue to be good. Continue to do good to others and you can be a peacemaker. Number seven, develop perseverance. Making peace can take time. It won't happen always in your first conversation. It might not happen in a day. It might not happen in weeks. It might not happen in months. And some of you, you've been through some human relationships, maybe with family and coworkers, where to get peace took years. Am I right? But even if we give it time and we continue to try to make peace, we develop perseverance, God can work. Just if it doesn't work on day one, play it cool. God is still at work. God is still going to do something. Don't panic. Continue to do good and develop perseverance. And here's the last point or the, the last tip for being a peacemaker. Trust God. Trust God. Listen, this is going to be our transition from the, the principle to the promise. The principle is blessed are the peacemakers. The promise is they'll be called sons of God. That means that when God uses us to bring peace, that people will see God working, not us working. So if God's doing the work, I need to trust him in the process. Is everybody with me today? If God's doing the work, I need to trust him in the process. Okay, God, you want to bring peace to this situation between me and my sibling between me and my brother, between me and my sister, you want to bring peace to this situation, God, I'm trusting you to work it out because there are some things that have to happen in my heart and their heart that we can't do on our own. God, you got to do the work. And then let's do this. When peace comes and we've uh, got maybe a victory or we feel like we accomplished something, let's give God the glory rather than saying, hey, I'm a peacemaker, look what I did. No, 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 let's recognize that God did something in that person and God did something in us and let's give him the honor, let's give him the glory, let's give him the honor that he deserves because he brings peace between people. He is Jehovah Shalom. So let's trust God that he's working in the process. Let's trust God that he's going to help us in that relationship at work. Let's trust God that he's going to help us in that relationship that we have in that civic organization that seems a little raw and there's difficulty and we know there's tension each time we talk. Man, let's trust God to work that thing out. Trust the Lord and you can be a peacemaker. Is everybody with me today? Now that brings us to the kingdom promise. They'll be called sons of God. Everybody listen carefully. I'm going to preach this fast. Are you ready? This is really cool. So what does children of God mean? We looked a little bit at peace, and we looked a little bit at peacemaker, and I gave you some practical tips for being a peacemaker, but what does it mean to be children of God? The literal translation in Greek is sons of God. Now, 
sometimes when we read things in the Bible and it uses male terms like sons of God, we think, does that mean the Bible's leaving the ladies out? That's not the case here. I think it's appropriate to translate this children of God. But here's what I want you to understand about what it means to be children of God in this particular sense. There's a metaphorical statement that's made here when when the writer says sons of God. And let me show you some other places where this sons of is used in scripture. Look at Acts chapter 4, verse 36. In Acts chapter 4, verse 36, there was a believer in the early church, and his name was Joseph. Joseph was a Levite. That means he's one of the Jewish people that could have possibly helped out in the work at the temple because he's of the tribe of Levi. This guy, Joseph, becomes a Christ follower. He's got some money and some land and means, and many people who were wealthy in the early church were were taking their possessions that were expensive and selling them and then giving the money to the apostles so they could distribute among the believers that were poor. Joseph had a field, he sold his property, and he he brought the money to the apostles. We're introduced to him as Joseph, but for the rest of the New Testament, he has a different name, and his name is Bar, which means son of, Nabas, which means encouragement. He's son of encouragement, and for the rest of the book of Acts, we know him as Barnabas the guy who traveled with the Apostle Paul. He receives this nickname, though his birth name is Joseph, because he was such an encourager. Do you see how son of encouragement became his nickname? It's like Jesus is saying, sons of God can be your nickname when you're a peacemaker. Like people are gonna know you for this. Here's another place where it's used. You look at the book of Luke, chapter 10. Jesus sends out the disciples. He sends them out two by two, and he gives them his instructions. He says, I want you to go find places to stay in the various different towns and villages that you're going. And when you go into a village and you find a home to stay in, the King James Version says this, find a peace-loving person. Find a peace-loving person. Why would Jesus need his disciples to stay with peace-loving people? Because they're preaching a message that says the kingdom of heaven is at hand. The kingdom of heaven is near. Jesus, our Messiah, is establishing a kingdom. Well, there are some people that live in this region that are political zealots, and they are ready to establish a kingdom that will rise up and throw off with military might and political intrigue the Roman Empire that's been ruling them. Jesus is saying, I don't want you to go stay with a political zealot because that won't move the gospel of the kingdom forward. Jesus is like, I got enough problems like that already. Don't go stay with somebody that's going to make a fuss in the community and make the gospel of the kingdom, which is a a message of peace and love and mercy and grace from God, something that's political and military in its orientation. He's like, find a person of peace. The other reason we want to find a person of peace is because there are some people who have religious angst. They are against worship at the temple. Like the people that wrote the Dead Sea Scrolls, the Essenes, they were so against the activity at the temple because it was a bunch of merchants and even Jesus turned over the tables of the money changers in the temple because he's like, you've made this house that should be a house of prayer, a den of robbers. And so these Essenes that lived out by the Dead Sea, they're like, we won't even go to the temple even though we're Jewish. And he's like, look, Don't stay in a house with somebody that's a religious zealot either. I need you to find a person that is a person of peace, a peace-loving person. And so here's the literal translation. The peace-loving person is a son of peace. Son of peace. It's a little phrase in Greek that means this is the character and nature of the person. Son of encouragement, son of peace. Listen, peacemakers are going to be known as sons of God, using that same metaphor. And you can be, you could be a host in the home that's a lady and be a person of peace, or a man and be a person of peace. You could be an encourager and be a son of encouragement and be a lady or be a man. And listen, you can be one of the sons of God. You can be a man or you can be a woman. But it means that in your peacemaking work, People see God in you. 
Can I remind you today that you are most like God when you do what God does? And let's bring it home a little bit more human. You're most like Jesus when you do what Jesus did. And Isaiah chapter 9 verse 6 says that Jesus is the Prince of Peace. Paul said it this way. He said, Jesus, he is our peace. And he has broken down the wall of separation. We're most like Jesus when we do what Jesus did. And Jesus was a peacemaker. And so he uses this phrase, you'll be called sons of God. People will see God in you. Now, my goal is not to show off and be like God. My goal is to please God and be like God. Amen? I want to be more like him because I love him. I want to be more like him because he's so good. I want to be more like him because he's so full of love. I want to be more like him because he's so full of truth and grace at the same time. Jesus is the Prince of Peace, and here's the cool thing. You can, you can take part in his peacemaking work, and people will recognize God in you when they see that peacemaking work being accomplished through you. Is everybody with me today? And being called sons of God, you know, sometimes the, the blessings that follow in the beatitude sounds like things we're really going to get something great out of, like, uh, blessed are the meek, they'll inherit the earth. And people are like, oh, I'll take more land. Right? This one, this one isn't about having more land or stuff. It's about being more like God. It's about being more like Jesus and letting Jesus shine through us. I'm going to invite the musicians to come to the front and let's stand to our feet. Let's pray. And then we're going to take the next few moments of this church service and pray. You know, our church services kind of function like this. In case you're kind of new to Livestream Church, here's how we do things. We worship. We come before the Lord with thanks and praise. Lord, Lord I'm telling you today, every, every beat of my heart is focused on you right now. Every beat of my heart, I'm going to give you praise and worship. Jesus, you're the lion and the lamb. Thank you for being my savior. I'm just worshiping Jesus for who he is. And then I'm gonna think about what he did for me on the cross. And I'm gonna just shout in victory that death was arrested. And my new life has begun because of what Jesus did in me. We worship God at the beginning. Then we listen to a message from the scriptures and we look at God's word. And I hope that the Holy Spirit speaks to you even while I'm preaching. And then the last part of the service we're getting ready to enter into right now, we respond in prayer. We respond in prayer. It's time for you to make a decision. What will I do with this message? Will I become a peacemaker? Will I take the initiative? Will I take the risk? Am I willing to try? Am I willing to speak the truth in love? Am I willing, am I willing to remove sin from my life so that I can make an, a difference in my world? Am I gonna be a person that's a peacemaker? And we make some commitments in our heart and we make some commitments in our minds and then we pray about some circumstances that we face. In a few minutes, I'm gonna ask the prayer team to come forward, the pastors to come forward and maybe you're facing a circumstance that's just not peaceful and you need a miracle from God. Some of you, you're facing, you're facing it. Listen, you can be a peacemaker in your home, in your marriage. Amen? I can't be a peacemaker. I'm not an ambassador of the United States of America. I can't be a peacemaker. I'm not a court-appointed advocate. Listen, you can be a peacemaker in your home. You can be a peacemaker in the place that you work. You can be a peacemaker at your school. You can be a peacemaker in the lunch break room, in the lunch room. You can be a peacemaker at your college. You can be a peacemaker in your neighborhood. And God's called us to be that kind of person. And we can be, amen? And so maybe you're facing a situation that needs God's peace. We're gonna pray. We're gonna ask for God's help. And maybe you need some inner peace. We're gonna pray. And we're gonna ask for God's help, amen? And God is gonna help us. I can have peace with God. Isn't that good news? You can have peace with God. 
Here's the second thing I want you to know. You can have peace with others. Amen? You can have peace with God. You can have peace with others. And here's the last thing. Because you're a peacemaker who can take Jesus into our world, you can bring peace to others with the gospel. Amen? People that have no peace with God, we have the, we have the amazing privilege and joy to present Jesus to them and help them find peace with God. We want to help people find and follow Jesus. And when they do, they can have peace with God as well. Blessed are the peacemakers. You guys see how you get to be a part? And I want people at Livestream Church to bring peace to this world in so many ways. There's some other passages of scripture that are in the outline and, and you can study them later today if you'd like to look at some more scriptures that really point us towards having peace with God, having peace with others, and then helping other people have peace with God. We've got some great Bible promises. I encourage you to read them. I want to invite the prayer team to come to the front. And hear